been brought to you by the matter you. All right, so we're all the way up to the letter U, and U gives us some unique contributions to the English language, like unctuous or usurious or ubiquitous. But in archaeology, U gives urban archaeology to you and me. Get it? Okay, so it sounds pretty obvious. Urban archaeology is archaeology that takes place in urban settings. Are you an idiot? And no matter what type of urban setting you have, the fact that it is urban already makes it immensely more complex than a site that had been less densely populated. Why? Well, that's because of people's proclivity to constantly rebuild, remodel, and renovate their spaces. We've got all the demo done. We've got the uh, garage door completely ripped out. We framed that up. We really wanted to open up that living room to the backyard and so did Otherwise, HGTV would be out of a job. But this is why urban archaeology is tough. You get layers and layers of stratigraphy due to the fact that urban spaces are constantly being reinvented and reimagined. You really can get lost in all the noise. Phone lines are over there! What did I say to you? The phone lines oh. are over there! Hey. What did hey, I say? Hey, hey. How many times? So to simplify things, archaeologists usually use a special kind of recording to note down all the information from their excavations in urban sites. If you recall from our stratigraphy episode, each layer that represents a specific event or time period is called a context. And urban sites, again, have a lot of these. And to simplify messy sites like this, archaeologists create something called a Harris matrix to record the stratigraphy. And using a basic set of numbering and symbols, Harris matrices can simplify even the most complex site so it can be readily understood. But on urban sites, each archaeological event or process, given its own context number, is also recorded on its own sheet separately. And then these are put on transparent sheets and transposed on one another to create a sort of layered view like this. And this method was designed by MOLA, the Museum of London Archaeology Unit in 1976, and it has come into wide use ever since. Now, of course, this makes for a lot more paperwork, but the complexity of these sites is such that it is required to really get an accurate representation reconstruction of the site once it's destroyed, which archaeology does. It's a destructive process. Now, increasingly, of course, this is also being done digitally. Now, there's another important distinction that would totally change the practice of urban archaeology, and that's if a site had been an urban site that was abandoned versus if it's a continuously occupied urban site, meaning people still live there today. Obviously, abandoned sites are simpler because you really don't need to worry about people's property values, moving vehicles, or heavy construction equipment around pedestrians. And this enormous goddamn rain crashes right down on her legs. <laughs> and she's screaming, my legs, my legs. And I say, no shit, your legs. You got a 2,000 pound goddamn rain on it. Or the economic pressures of needing to redevelop. So on these abandoned sites, archaeologists can really take the time to do thorough, research-driven excavations. Some great examples of this are Çatalhöyük in Turkey, Pompeii in Italy, or Rossiter in England. The difficulty, of course, is when you're working in a busy city with people all around, property values are sky high, and time says archaeologists have to move quickly. They're operating under tight deadlines and even tighter budgets. They really can't just take their time digging wherever because they want to. And developers usually want to get things done pronto. Well, let's get there fast because I'm quickly losing patience. So things can and often do go wrong. A good example of a bad example of this would be the African burial ground in Lower Manhattan, where developers were secretive and pushing for a quick and dirty solution, leading to a massive public outcry. 
However, it's not all bad news. In many cases, these excavations are done with a lot of care, with patient developers, and a guiding principle to learn as much as possible from, or even to preserve, the heritage. A good example of this? The Anson Street Cemetery for Enslaved People in Charleston, South Carolina, which is uncovered in 2013 during the construction of a new theater. And this is a really good counterpoint to the disaster in Lower Manhattan. The sensitivity with which that was done and the subsequent DNA project won appreciation in the community and widespread plaudits in the press. Another good example is just a short walk from my house here at the London Mithranium beneath Bloomberg's headquarters. Free to visit and I believe the best preserved of these mysterious cultic sites in the former Roman world, the Mithranium is a really cool experience if you find yourself in central London with a spare 30 or 60 minutes. The only other Mithranium I ever saw was randomly in Yaitse, Bosnia, and that was much smaller and more fragmentary and really had no presentation or experience to bring it to life. And to be clear, in a city with such a long period of continuous occupation, like Athens or Rome or London, the only way to really get a picture of what's going on, because you can't just dig wherever, is very, very slowly as things are being built. A new subway station and you've got thousands of years of history. A new office building and you've got the frickin' Rose Theater, where Shakespeare himself once played. And it's only very, very slowly that you can piece it all together. Anyway, you get the picture. Urban archaeology is tough. It's painstaking and expensive. And if done in a still-occupied city, really can't be done except over many decades. If you like what you heard, give me that thumbs up below, hit that bell to subscribe, or if you want to support more independent archaeology content, consider contributing to my Patreon, where you can enjoy some exclusive members-only benefits and other goodies. Until the next dig.